Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, A New Chemistry for an Old Foe, Managing Annual Bluegrass Weevil with the Insect Growth Regulator, Suprato, brought to you by Golfdom and our sponsor of the event, QualiPro. QualiPro provides solutions for lawn care professionals, sports turf managers, and golf course superintendents that are backed by university research and a dedicated staff of professionals. I'm Mackenzie Shoemaker from North Coast Media, content marketing producer for Golfdom, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to golfdom.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Q&A panel at the left-hand side of your console. If you have a question, type it in the panel's text box, then click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask and enter any questions you may have for our speakers during the presentation. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. Questions submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be covered during the presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, you may use the same Q&A panel on your screen to submit your issue, and assistant producer Joey Ciccolini or I will personally assist you. You may learn more about our speakers by viewing their bio, photo, and email address in the panel located on the upper left-hand side of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues Using the Share This widget, you'll see at the bottom left corner of the screen. You may download a version of today's slides from the presentation and the resources widget, as well as access the QualiPro website and the Gulfdom website. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. <clears throat> Today we'll be, we will be hearing from Dr. Ben McGraw, Associate Professor at Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Ben McGraw is an Associate Professor of Turfgrass Science at Penn State University, specializing in insect pest management. Current projects in the McGraw Lab combine basic and applied approaches to better understand population outbreaks to improve cultural and chemical controls and to develop alternative control strategies. We will also be hearing from Ion, McGr Ion Rodriguez, my apologies, Technical Service Manager for QualiPro. Ian Rodriguez is the Technical Service Manager supporting QualiPro product development at Control Solutions Incorporated. He has more than 25 years of experience in the turf and ornamental industries, including academia, design and installation, pest control, and maintenance. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ben McGraw, entomologist at Penn State University. As most of you probably know, Dr. McGraw has been working on annual blue bluegrass weevil management for throughout his career and consults with many courses throughout the U.S. on this pest and other aspects of golf course management. He has been working with the Suprato product for three years and will give some insight on how Suprato has, can be a game-changing tool for ABW management. Dr. McGraw, take it away. Thank you, Mackenzie. This is probably the best type of webinar where you don't get to see me you can you can picture me in this 2014 version of myself here where i'm not gray and well showered so you can close your eyes and think of that but uh today i'm happy to present some of the research that my laboratory has been conducting for the last three years on this uh, new product that should be coming out relatively soon uh suprato or what we uh, were told was Novaloron three years ago, and, and more recently, uh, now we know it as Suprato. So it's a pretty exciting uh, new compound, and, and I will be just sharing the work that we've done on annual bluegrass weevil and only speak uh, to the annual bluegrass weevil side of things. So, you know, I think it is important to uh, discuss some of the factors that really make annual bluegrass weevil uh, a really difficult pest and the primary pest that we work on in my laboratory. Uh, it, because of the compressed nature of this time, we don't have uh, the luxury to go into all the specifics, and, and you can get that education uh, other places, hopefully, uh, golf industry show and whatnot. 
but I do think that it is, is important to set the stage as far as how Suprata works and, and where it can be integrated. Uh, I would say out of all the insect pests that we work in our laboratory, this one is by far the most challenging just based on its biology. You know, the adult is a very important stage to control, in my opinion. And in general, if we're just talking in generalities, uh, adult beetles are very, very difficult to control. They're like little tanks. Uh, the next factor that makes them very difficult to control, and as, as I have outlined, uh, the body shape of this larva in the plant is that they have cryptic stages. So they hide their stages into the plant. The eggs are deposited into the stem of the plant occasionally, especially on low-cut turf. Uh, they might be deposited loosely, and then they bore into the plant. Uh, the fact of the matter is they're going to spend, you know, one to three instars inside this plant that really makes them protected from uh, most of our chemical controls, especially those that work through contact activity. So hidden or cryptic stages makes it very, very challenging. Then the really kind of uh, the nature of the damage as well as how they feed later on in life is very problematic. So their biology being crown feeders as they get too large uh, to fit inside the stem of the plant means that we need to have controls that work very, very effectively and they need to work very quickly. So as they emerge from the plant in that third uh, to fourth instar and start feeding on the crown, that's the active growing portion of the plant. Uh, if we don't have controls in place prior to their arrival, uh, and hopefully those controls have some residual activity, uh, we could be seeing some serious uh, turf collapse if we have a lot of larvae in a small amount of area. Now, looking at some of the, the factors that we have across uh, eastern North America from, you know, the maritime provinces all the way down uh, into North Carolina uh, and these other spot areas like Arkansas uh, where these populations have appeared, what you can see is that we're going to have the sequence from egg to adult occur multiple times throughout its region. And really, uh, unless we do a very detailed census on these populations, we're really just kind of guessing on how many times this happens because these stages will occur and then, uh, you know, the next generation will form and we'll start to have overlapping stages. So really, there's only been a couple of really detailed studies that have looked at exactly how many generations we have. Uh, and so I would say that these are rules of thumb uh, in many places throughout the year. So multiple generations means uh, multiple sequence of interventions need to occur. And really, we don't know the timing of these things in new places where they've appeared, such as Wisconsin most recently, or Southern Indiana, uh, Louisville, Arkansas. Uh, those things have not really been adequately described. But what we do probably see is this latitudinal gradient of generations as we move to the south. So the, the point here is multiple generations really require thinking out through the year, thinking about rotating chemistries and doing battle with this pest multiple times throughout the year. Now, the big, big factor about those multi multiple generations means uh, by the time we get to summer in any place that has more than one generation, we're going to start to see overlapping generations. So we might have in-plant stages, the first three instars co-occurring with pupae. Uh, what I've done with these stars on these different stages is I've really identified the three stages, if we count uh, these two adult stages, the newly formed adult and adult as separate stages, really three out of these uh, eight stages really that are susceptible to our chemistries that we have available to us. Uh, because those insects that are early larvae are inside the plant and they're protected, most of our chemistries don't work on those. The pupae are not really uh, they're more naturally resistant, if you will, to a lot of our chemistries and in the soil, as well as our, our callow or tenoral adult. So very few opportunities to really go after this insect with our traditional chemistry. All right, so the biology is one thing that really sets this insect apart from other insects that we deal with in turf. Uh, another one that really makes it uh, a big concern for most turf grass managers, especially here in the Northeast, is the areas of the turf that it damaged. Uh, it is, really seems to prefer these shorter mode uh, heights of cut, 
there's additional stresses on these areas, such as traffic, as you can see in this area. Uh, but these are also very high visibility areas uh, where this insect is going to attack. So these are all areas uh, that we need to have pristine throughout the year and in, in really challenging environmental times, such as uh, middle of the summer. And it's really kind of adding insult to injury when you get weevil larvae in these areas. The third thing that I think is, makes this insect really difficult to manage, um, and apart from really kind of other turfgrass insects, is that we have very few products that work effectively against this insect. So if we looked at really kind of all the classes of insecticides that we have available to control any turfgrass insect pests, we could eliminate several of these as being ineffective against this insect. So we have a very limited buffet. And in cases where we might have three generations per year and we're already thinking about rotating different insecticide classes, it becomes a big, big challenge to really plan out your year as far as what you're going to do as far as the sequence of applications that you need to make against this insect. Along with that, uh, we have some products that we have used uh, quite frequently throughout the year in kind of a traditional management approach. And I bring up this traditional management approach of targeting the adults as they come out of overwintering with a contact insecticide, followed by a larval uh, application later on, uh, is that if we start to divide these things up into the different stages that this insect, uh, that we would use against this insect, it really further reduces that buffet that we have or that menu that we have of insecticides. So traditionally, we've used contacts against the adults. Those are usually organophosphates uh, or pyrethroids. Uh, in many places, we're losing uh, chlorpyrifos or have already lost chlorpyrifos, or it's going to happen very soon. That's one of the organophosphates, uh, leaving us with acetate as far as the organophosphate and the pyrethroids. There are also combination products that we can use against the adults uh, to limit egg laying and reduce future larval damage. As far as the larvicides go, uh, we have some different modes of action that we can use, which is nice to switch them up. But really, if we look at it, we're, we're really talking about a handful of products that are going to provide effective management. So the traditional approach has once of, has been applying an insecticide against the adults as they come out of overwintering to now applying adulticides followed by larvicides followed by uh, whatever comes next down the line. Now, as you can see with that approach with limited products and limited products that work effectively, uh, you can see where this is taking us. And in many cases throughout Eastern North America, what we've seen is uh, these populations of weevils developing resistance first to the pyrethroids and so resistance to the pyrethroids is documented over 15 years ago. Uh, shortly after that, cross resistance was documented, meaning if you develop resistance to uh, one active ingredient uh, within the pyrethroid class, it conferred resistance to other pyrethroid insecticides, so like a bifenthrin and a lambda cyhalothrin. Uh, but what is far scarier with the development of resistance in these insects is this idea of multiple resistance, that by over-applying one class or one active ingredient, that you would develop resistance to an unrelated class. So in cases where resistance to pyrethroids had developed, what we started to see in 2009 is that new chemistries coming onto the market uh, were uh, not effective against these populations. So where high levels of pyrethroid resistance occurs, we can often see multiple resistance uh, where unrelated chemistries are now affected. So that's something that we definitely, definitely want to avoid because we're already starting from a point of weakness in limited products. All right, so that is really my quick and dirty, as quickly as I can give you an overview about ABW and all the nuances of the pests. And I think probably if you're on this call, you're, you're probably fairly familiar with that, uh, or you're about to become from fairly familiar with it if you're dealing with a population for the first time. The rest of the talk, I want to focus on really just the field trial data that we've conducted with Nova Loron or Suprato uh, since 2019 first as a CSI product and now uh, QualiPro, the early work that I did 
uh, with Ian and, and Doug at, at CSI and now with Quali Pro. So things that we're going to see with field trials, you know, as a scientist, what we like to see is really controlled environments where we can uh, adjust for all these sorts of environmental um, kind of variables that are thrown at us. What you will see with field trials, and if you look at a lot of field trial data, is that they can be very variable from one year to the next. So there's lots of influences going on on an insect population out in the field. And so it, it might not look as clean uh, as what we'd expect to see in the laboratory. And I'll, I'll point out some of those uh, lack of cleanliness in, in data as we go through these. But for the most part, when products work really well, the data in the field also works really well, and that makes us happy as field scientists. So this is uh, the location where we performed the majority of our trials, and I would like to have a shout out to uh, Scott Fisher at the Country Club of Harrisburg here in central uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, these have been very dense populations of weevils over the years. Uh, this is one of the holes that uh, Scott has left untreated, pretty much T to green for us. What you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the right-hand side, However, that would be an overwintering site where the weevils walk out, and what you can see is my technician, Danny, is spraying a trial that is biased to one edge of the fairway, uh, and it's replicated uh, across the fairway with these different plots. So these plots will receive different treatments uh, where they're applied in different sequences. So the early uh, work that we did at Country Club at Harrisburg, which I would characterize as a, a pretty stereotypical population, that it's moderately resistant to the pyrethroids, meaning um, you would definitely see a, a decrease in susceptibility uh, to not only the pyrethroids, but other unrelated classes. So with a population like this, if I see a product, a single application, so in the springtime, if we make one application, maybe it's against the adults or it's against the larvae, and we come back and we look at the larval densities a couple of weeks later, I would be thrilled absolutely excited with 40 to 60 percent control from a single uh, product. So keep that in mind. So in the early days of Nova Loron, we looked at two different formulations uh, at two different rates, the 102 and the 136 fluid ounces per acre. Pretty much our default uh, for applying insecticides is applying it in a two gallon per thousand carrier, and we irrigate that in what I would consider lightly, maybe some of you would disagree, but a tenth of an inch of irrigation. So in this first year, we didn't really know what we had. We, we looked at one application, and that was in May 15th. So nothing was applied in those Suprato or Nova Loron treatments until May 15th. And at that time, we were, as you can see, averaging about 250 larvae per square foot in our untreated control. So incredibly, incredibly dense. Uh, we will have some natural mortality, so that's probably not going to be the case by June. Uh, but at that time, what we could see is that the population was averaging about two and a half in stars. So, you know, half, you could think about the population being straddled between second and third in stars. So mostly within the plant. And this is what we saw. So what we can see with the two formulations, the CS and the flowable, the F version of Nova Loron, we can see anywhere between 58% uh, control and 92% control with the larvae. The internal standard Ferenc is working exactly how I would expect it, excellent control at 72% control. So it is a little bit wonky. We don't see uh, the 102 giving uh, less control than the 136 and the CFs. Uh, it looks a little cleaner on the flowable. Uh, but what we can see as a general trend, as kind of a quick and dirty field trial, is that we had very, very high densities of larvae. By the time we evaluated those trials, we had uh, greater than 80 larvae per square foot. And these populations were being effectively reduced. Uh, and often, in most cases, well, with all of these treatments, below damaging thresholds of 40 larvae per square foot. So not the cleanest data, but data that we're definitely excited about, definitely um, uh, alerts us to something interesting there and, and worth further investigation. 
So moving forward in 2020, we started to take uh, kind of, uh, you know, we dug into the literature a little bit more and kind of try to figure out a little bit more about Nova Loron and really kind of designed experiments around timing. So we had really three timings in mind, which are pretty appropriate for this insect, one being at adult peak. So this would be when forsythia is in the half green, half gold stage. Uh, this occurred in, you know, mid-April in our part of the world. I have growing degree days there. That's uh, a March 1st, uh, 50 degree Fahrenheit scale for growing degree days. Uh, so fairly early in the year, early in the growing degree days, we had a, a single application at early instar timing that occurred in mid-May, which was very similar to the 2019 trials. Uh, those stages were a little bit younger than what we had assessed in the previous year's trials. And then the third timing was when rhododendrons in full bloom. So this is when the larvae are mostly going from third instars to fourth instars or entering the soil. So that's in late May, pretty close to Memorial Day here in the US. So these are all single application treatments. So it's not that these are sequential applications, it's just a single application at one of these three timings. But we did look at three different rates. So if there's three rates and three timings, those are nine different treatments that we're looking at. We looked at uh, 68, 97, and 136 fluid ounces per acre. So what we saw, and we'll, I'm just going to release this one at a time here so that we don't get overwhelmed with the data. Uh, as you can see, the bifenthrin standard here at the adult timing did not provide uh, any suppression. It's not that they grew more weevils. It's just that's the way it happens sometimes in field trials. But what we did see with this adult timing, so when we applied this at adult peak, when all of these, uh, or the majority of the insects had left overwintering sites and were at maximum density on the fairway, if we made an application at that timing, we got between 67 and 100% control. So that adult timing at that high rate, those plots were spotless. There were no larvae in it at Memorial Day or the first week in June when we assessed those trials. If we look at the early instar timing, again, those treatments are looking really good. We see between 76% and 95% control when those insects were averaging an instar of 1.8. So not even second instars, they're still within the plant at this time. Uh, it might have been a little bit too early for a couple of our standards. Uh, with Ferenc and Tetrino, but uh, again, that's the variability of trials. We're seeing some nice reduction in a dose response method or manner rather from Suprato. As we move to larger insect, these insects are the ones that are popping out of the plant and beginning to feed on the crown. What we can see is a little bit of breakdown in the product. So we got between 0% at the low rate all the way up to 95% control of the larvae at that late May timing. Uh, our standard did not do very well. It could have been a little too late for those insects uh, to really be susceptible to those products. But what we can see is that Soprato at these high rates, between 95% and 100% control. So independent of timing, it did really, really well at the high rate. And what we did see that was really nice that makes us think that these results are real or at least uh, uh, performing properly is that we do see a nice dose response in the 2020 assay. So from low to high, we're seeing as we increase the concentration, it's performing better and better. All right, so in 2021, just this last year, we conducted trials again. That last uh, trial, I believe we had a uh, larvae around uh, somewhere between 20 and 40 larvae per square foot in the untreated. In uh, this year, it's been an incredibly, incredibly light year for weevils here in Pennsylvania, and we've seen populations kind of plummet. Uh, we did have 10 larvae per square foot in our trials, which is pretty low. Uh, we'd like to see it higher, but we'd also expect these products to work really, really well when we have low densities. And what we did see is just that. So we saw even bifenthrin did really well at this timing, but all of the Soprato treatments, whether it's 97 fluid ounces or 128 fluid ounces, or an application at adult peak and then coming back at late instars, all of those were spotless, no larvae in those treatments. 
Now we included a different timing in 2021 as I thought it might be important to wait for all of these adults since we saw a great control with a high rate at all timing. We didn't want to uh, make an application and have more adults migrate in. So I thought that the seven day after the adult peak would be the ideal timing. And I guess I wasn't wrong, but uh, we don't really have anything to, uh, to say that this is better than applying at the adult peak, but we also saw 100% control on both of those treatments at that timing. Once we move into early instar, again, these products are performing very, very low against low densities. And then what we see as we move later is what we were seeing before, the high rate seemed to control it very well. You know, the three quarters rate uh, or three quarts per acre rate uh, start to see a little bit of uh, a chink in the armor there, if you will. So we had about 90% control, which is still fantastic. And you can see our standard match point performed excellent as well. So not a lot to glean out of the 2021 trials. I like, uh, you know, 2020 trials where we can see a little bit more separation. But what we're seeing is really, you know, kind of backing up. It's not uh, conflicting with the earlier data. It's showing very strong reductions at all of these time points. What I would say is it does seem that rate is important if we're gonna ignore timing. And what we could see at least in the 2020 uh, trials is that the earlier we went, uh, the better. So closer to adult peak. So really looking at all these three years of data, uh, you know, this is something that we spent a lot of time looking over the data and thinking about what it does and trying to understand really how this product works. And the great thing is this has been around for a while, just not in turf, but really we can learn a lot from agriculture and where this product has been used, how it's been used against uh, resistant insects and other cropping systems uh, to really kind of make an informed decision about how we're gonna integrate this product into the turf grass market. And we can talk later in the, in the Q and A about uh, really how it, we can predict it would behave, how it would behave against other insects. Really all the work that we've done in my laboratory has been on annual bluegrass weevil. But there are certain characteristics that we could uh, assume that it would have against other turf grass pests or other areas for people to investigate down the road. So the first thing that we need to be aware of is that this product is really not like all of the other products that we have out on the market. Uh, we did have a growth regulator in the 90s, halopenicide, that was used against white grubs, and it was a growth regulator. So this arrow is pointing to uh, really the 9% uh, of products that are sold globally, global insecticide markets that are growth regulators. The vast majority of what we deal with is a nerve toxin. You know, it's, it's going to work either on the nerves or on the muscles, like the anthranilidiamides. Uh, so this is, this is working in very, very different ways to how um, these products are, are going to work. And I do see a question. I'll, I'll just handle questions as I go through. So Daryl says, are these rates okay on greens or just peas, fairway, height of turf? Uh, we have our, our trials are primarily on fairway height of turf. Uh, we have applied it at our research farm uh, to uh, green tight, but those green tights are going to be about an eighth of an inch, so a little bit higher than what other people would have. I don't, I have not seen any phytotoxicity issues um, whatsoever with this. I think maybe I and Rodriguez can can talk to more about that later on. All right, so what I showed earlier as far as the menu, what we have for insecticides on the market did not include, you know, class 15 through 18 in the IRAC classification code. And where Novaloron belongs to is a BPU or benzyl phenylurea or benzyl urea uh, chitin inhibiting growth regulation. So I think it is important to discuss really kind of how it works, that it's going to be important for how we integrate this product into our programs. So many of you are aware that insects uh, are composed of an exoskeleton, so their muscles attach outward into a framework, unlike ours that attach inward. And that framework is really composed of a substance called chitin, which we can find in fungi and whatnot. So with 
an insect that's basically living inside of a container, if it's going to grow, if it's going to advance to the next stage, so like the instars that we talked about, going from a first instar to a second to a third, in order to get bigger, it needs to molt. It basically needs to break out of its exoskeleton. In order to do so, what it has to do is separate from that container on the outside, if you will, separate on the inside, form a new exoskeleton, and then break out of that one. So what we're seeing here with this picture of the cicada is that's already formed an exoskeleton, and that shed or that cuticle that it's breaking out of is the old one. So this is a very complex process. It involves a lot of hormones circulating through the body to tell the insect when to do this. So it's very, very energy expensive. And we can see some mortality, natural mortality that occurs at these different stages if these processes do not go right. So that happens all the time. This is kind of the cross section of what that exoskeleton looks like. So I have arrows up here in the outside world and the inside of the insect. And that exoskeleton is much like our fingernails or our hair, that it's a non-living layer. Beneath that are living cells that secrete fluid that will separate that exoskeleton and it will form new ones. And where Novaloron or Suprato is going to work is on this non-living layer called the endocuticle. So if we can disrupt the hormonal process or we can disrupt the integrity of any of these layers, it can lead to things like dehydration or loss of water from the body. Uh, or it can just, we can often uh, apply these growth regulators that are just going to cause the insect to molt inappropriately or at wrong times. In this case, Novaloron is working on this endocuticle layer. So what does this all mean? Why are we going down this kind of physiology uh, path? Is that what this product should be working on is larvae, because these stages are going to molt until they become adult, and they're no longer going to molt once they become an adult. So really, this is a product that we see as being something that works against larvae. We would suspect that this product, based on other studies in agriculture, is going to work through contact, the insect coming in contact with the active ingredient, and also ingesting the active ingredient. So something like this is going to take a while for the insect to die. It's not going to be a rapid death like we see with some of our older, harsher chemistries that kill the insect immediately. It's going to affect it when it goes to molt in the next time. Now, at this point, if you're paying attention, you're thinking, wait a minute, we just saw all this data that said that the adult timing was the best timing. What's actually going on here? And I will answer Doug Lindy's question about the AI being translocated through the plant. I think uh, there is something to that. It's something that uh, I'm going to turn over to the the experts at QualiPro. So how is it that the adult timing seems to be the best timing? Well, when you go to the literature, there's often uh, some reports about sublethal, so non-killing effects on the adult. And what we did in 2020 that we've repeated in 2021 is we've looked at these sublethal effects on the adults. What does it do? to the reproductive systems of the insect, what does it do to egg hatch? So in 2020, what we first started with is doing these assays uh, where we applied Novaloron to the turf and then placed insects on it, or we took the insects off after they laid eggs and applied uh, Novaloron. So really the two treatments that we had, uh, or actually four treatments that we had, were two rates of Novaloron, or Suprato, so 102 and 136 fluid ounces per acre. Adults were either sprayed over the top when they were on the turf grass and allowed to lay eggs, or the adults were not sprayed, they were allowed to lay eggs, and then we removed them and sprayed the turf. And what we did is, in both cases, they were removed after seven days. We let those plugs go for another five days, and at 12 days after we treated the turf, we then heat extracted the turf to get the eggs to hatch out, and then we could count the number of larvae to see what effect either direct spray or spraying the turf with Novaloron had on these insects. And I'm sorry that I didn't make this into a graph, but this is a table. And what we saw was amazing control 
of larvae. Whether we sprayed the adults directly, we seem to have yet much better. So the adults that were sprayed and then put on the turf, there was a 91 to 98 percent reduction in eggs. So as determined by larvae hatching out. If we let the adults lay eggs and then we remove them and sprayed the turf, we got 67 to 85 percent control. So the crazy thing with all of this is this did not kill any of the adults. All the adults are fine in these assays. But what we did see is a strong effective rate in both of these areas. And we see whether we sprayed the adults directly or if we sprayed the turf, those insects either did not make viable eggs or those eggs never hatched, you know, those eggs never, never hatched out or it reduced the adult's ability to lay eggs. So we repeated a similar approach since we were really only looking at larvae in both of those instances. What we wanted to do in 2021 is slightly change up the assays a little bit. So same type of setup where we have adults laying eggs uh, into these tubes, but they were treated first and then placed into these uh, hotels. What we are now doing is rather than a short time period, we wanted to track these individuals over their reproductive life. So individuals are placed in this, one male and one female, and each week we go through these conical tubes. So these conical tubes have uh, annual bluegrass growing at green tight, uh, slightly a little bit higher than what most people would mow green. So I think these are at 150, uh, 0.15 inches for our Canadian friends. Uh, I'm not even going to try to do the metric conversion on the fly, but I should know this. What we have to do is we go through these uh, plants. We make sure that the male and the female are alive, and if they are, we transfer them to fresh cores uh, maintained at green height. And then we have to go through each one of these tillers to look for individual eggs. So it involves looking under a microscope and pulling back these individual tillers. Here you can see two eggs uh, in the leaf or in the stem of the plant. So we have to pull back each leaf of each tiller uh, and looking at it. So what we saw, uh, we were able to run two experiments um, this spring and, and they look a little bit different between the two experiments. Uh, and that's why it's separated out like this. But what we saw in the maroon line is the untreated, the number of eggs laid per female each week. And what we can see in the dotted lines or the dashed lines are the low rate in orange or in that puke green, the high rate of Nova Loron or Suprato. And what we can see is that we got between 20 and 78% or 79% fewer eggs over the duration of this life cycle. What you can see is immediately that high is a little bit suppressed. What we see in the low, there is an effective rate there, but this is not telling us about the viability of the eggs. What it is saying is that this active ingredient, when applied against the adults, is reducing the number of eggs that they laid. And this is really only one exposure to the, these insects. So they're directly treated and then they're placed on the turf. So it's not like they're constantly walking through this active ingredient. So it is having a suppressive effect on the ability to lay eggs. We don't know if any of these eggs hatched out, that we're just looking solely, are there eggs in here or are they not? We don't know if uh, all of the Novaloron treated eggs are gonna hatch out. So that's something to keep in mind, but very, very interesting effect of this active ingredient. So, you know, as I wrap up, it is important to note that I do not know a lot about this product. Uh, I still have questions. I think there's plenty of research to be done in the future. Uh, it is super interesting. It really works very different from our traditional chemistries. Uh, we don't know whether or not uh, this product affects pupae because we could see that the pupa stage is a stage uh, that we can often very easily detect in soil. None of the chemistries work very well against it, uh, if at all. And it is a stage that the insect would have to molt one more time to become an adult. Uh, we don't know about the effects on first generation adults. So those adults that are typically formed in the month of June, at least here in Pennsylvania, uh, not the overwintering adults, but the first generation adults, um, they feed a lot more. We can see in other studies that there is a rebound effect that these uh, insects after they feed 
uh, on untreated foliage uh, can possibly become less susceptible to this product. Uh, but so far, what it looks really interesting is it, this kind of sublethal effect against the adults, as well as the lethal effect on larvae. Uh, you know, and as uh, Doug Lindy asked in the comment section, uh, is there translaminar activity? Is it being translocated through the plant? Um, I don't think that it's necessarily being taken up by the roots, uh, but it is possible that th there is some translaminar activity, at least that effect on the early instars that are inside the plant uh, would suggest that there is some movement, at least translaminar activity going through that. Uh, I really think that uh, an important thing to figure out would be the residual activity. Uh, however, that might be more of an academic exercise for someone like me uh, rather than the practitioner, as it seems like really uh, the timing is, uh, is, is less important than, than rate from all of our field studies. So with that, uh, there's lots of people I want to thank, especially Scott Fisher at CCH and all of my lab crew, Danny Klein, Audrey, Garrett, and Ying. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to you, Mackenzie. Thank you, Dr. McGraw. That was great. We will now hear from Dr. Ian Rodriguez, Technical Services Manager for the QualiPro Products Line at Control Solutions, Inc. ION coordinates product development research for the QualiPro division and also provides technical support for sales, distributors, and end users. He will now share additional information about Soprato and its potential role in an annual bluegrass weevil management program. ION, take it away. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, just want to uh, talk a little bit more about what we know about Novaloron and uh, share some additional data with some additional cooperators that have been working with the product as well. Um, so Novaloron is an IRAC group 15 mode of action or inhibitor of chitin biosynthesis. And, you know, it results typically in what you would refer to as an aborted malt. Uh, of a juvenile stage going from one stage to the next, which uh, results in death. The, the exoskeleton protects them from desiccation. It's how their muscles are attached. Uh, they can't function when they have a malformed uh, exoskeleton. And, and in lab studies with other pests, uh, like the American cockroach on the right here, um, you know, this is typical of what we would see. Uh, as it tries to molt to the next growth stage. Malformation, this one's split wide open. Uh, he's not long for this world when this photo was taken. Uh, we've, we've actually had Novaluron in our CSI line uh, for a while, which is our professional pest control products line, uh, for things like cockroaches, mosquitoes, et cetera. Um, but uh, Dr. McGraw in 2019 was the first time we looked at it in a uh, turf pest uh, at the suggestion of another entomologist. Uh, and so that started the adventure into registration for turf. What made annual bluegrass weevil stand out as a potential target has been shared uh, was the damage done by the immature stages and the dwindling options and increasing resistance issues with that particular pest. Um, what we know about Novaluron and knew at the time, uh, you know, as Dr. McGraw explained, is that adult insects do not molt. So we didn't particularly expect uh, any of the uh, activity that he has observed uh, since initially uh, on adults. Uh, we just expected to hopefully potentially affect the larva. So it works by in ingestion or contact. Uh, and in row crop work, uh, this, this AI has been in ag and row crops, uh, things like cotton, uh, corn, et cetera, uh, for a while. Uh, and it's known to have some translaminar movement, meaning movement from, you know, say one side of the leaf to the other, um, but not known to be systemic. Uh, not known for root uptake and being distributed throughout the plant. So as noted, uh, 
we're releasing this product under the name Soprato, um, and all of Dr. McGraw's work there, the F or flowable version of Novaluron uh, became this, Soprato. It's an SC formulation, 10% uh, concentration. The rates are slightly different than what we saw in some of the earlier trials just because of scale up to, to the manufacturing uh, size batches. Uh, so the labeled rates equivalent active ingredient rates for Soprato will be uh, three or four quarts per acre for annual bluegrass weevil. It's going to be available in a one-gallon jug. Uh, we've got federal registration and have submitted to the states. We've got, I think, maybe 10 states back already um, and expect more uh, as the weeks continue. So. Um, just a quick summary, I won't beat this too much because uh, it was covered so thoroughly prior. Um, typically targeting the so-called stages or stage one, two, and three, that adult peak, half gold, half green, forsythia timing, the small larva, internally feeding larva, um, or the two and a half to third stage larva when they're just emerging from the stems and starting to feed. Uh, externally. These are all three timings that, uh, as you've already seen, uh, we have very good efficacy with Soprato. So after uh, Dr. McGraw's initial results in 2019, uh, we knew he was going to continue expanding that work in 2020, but we also wanted to look at, at it with other sites and other cooperators. Uh, and so we turned to uh, Steve McDonald of Turfgrass Disease Solutions. He's well known uh, in most annual bluegrass weevil circles in, the, in that region uh, for consulting and, and research work that he does. Uh, and so we went with the uh, adult time, yes, the, uh, excuse me, we shot for the late that uh, third stage timing. Uh, when the application was done in this particular trial, uh, they were already averaging over the fourth stage, so maybe a little bit later than would be ideal. Um, and some damage was even observed at the time of application. So it was maybe a little bit later than ideal. Uh, however, when we did the, uh, or when Steve did the counts, uh, we had excellent, excellent control, even of those larger than ideal larva. And then again, uh, this year, uh, Steve also looked at the three timings that Dr. McGraw looked at in 2020, and we got excellent control uh, at the high rate with the adult peak timing, the small larva and the medium two and a half to third stage larval timings. So consistent control at additional sites. This population isn't um, known to be pyrethroid resistant. It's been managed uh, to avoid that at this particular location. Additionally, uh, we asked Dr. Albert Kopenhofer at Rutgers, uh, also uh, an expert in annual bluegrass weevil management, um, to take a look at it this year as well. Uh, and this was on a characterized as a 55X pyrethroid resistant annual bluegrass weevil population that he works with. Uh, and again, we did it at those three uh, typical or traditional timings. Uh, and you can see the results, the high rate uh, for the peak migration and the small larval timings, uh, better than 90% control, approaching 100%, consistent with what Dr. McGraw has been seeing at that earlier timing, seems to be the most ideal timing for it. Uh, and then as the larval get larger, uh, it starts to uh, maybe not work quite as well, although 80% uh, and approaching 90% control uh, as described, is still pretty good efficacy for annual bluegrass weevil approach. 
these are single apps again everything that that we that I've just covered are single applications. So for any of bluegrass weevil, uh, it's highly effective, uh, including against pyrethroid resistant populations. Um, so no signs so far of resistance to, uh, or I guess you would call it, uh, uh, is it not cross resistant, but the additional, uh, resistance to other classes that comes with uh, some pyrethroid resistant populations. Uh, at adult peak migration timing, again, that's that half gold, half green for Scythia. Plant phenology timing, uh, excellent, excellent prevention of the damaging larval stages when applied at that timing. Um, attributed, as Dr. McGraw has suggested, to uh, mainly reduced adult fecundity or the reduced ability to produce offspring. Also excellent, excellent control at the small, medium, and even large stages. We saw that fourth uh, average, fourth instar timing. We had excellent control, although at that late stage, uh, you're probably already on the cusp of damage if you've got uh, that type of a, uh, density in your, in your bluegrass weevil population that season. Um, however, this could b bode well potentially for uh, later into the summer applications where you have more overlap of uh, your growth stages and, you know, it could be a sort of a good coverall approach, so to speak, or as near to it as you're probably going to get uh, with this particular pest. Uh, it's just not something to bank on as a rescue type treatment if you're already seeing damage, so to speak, because it, it will take a couple of days. It's not something to expect a uh, quick knockdown, so to speak, uh, because of the, the mode of action. So putting it all together, what we envision as a Prado annual bluegrass weevil strategy or uh, program, so to speak, uh, I think the best fit would be this program A, uh, which would be to time it for the adult peak migration uh, as where it seems to have uh, at the full rate the highest level of activity consistently at multiple sites and multiple seasons, uh, and then follow with a rotation of chemistries because, again, you know, we, we want to be we want to promote good stewardship of this product so that it's not over relied on and potentially uh, accelerating uh, the potential for resistance to it. Um, we haven't seen it yet, but uh, we want to try and make sure we don't see it. So that program may lead with Soprato, second application, uh, bring in one of the diamide options um, at that point, large, any breakthrough where you need the rescue type treatment, maybe reach for more of the contact uh, type uh, options. And then into that, I suppose this would be second generation uh, at this point into the summer uh, or as needed where you've got those overlapping uh, growth stages would be something potentially lead on Soprato for again. Alternately, if, if you um, are still confident in your adult or adulticide, in quotes, timing uh, with bifenthrin or, you know, for one more season, you'll have a clopyrifos that's going to go away uh, as far as we know by uh, October of 2022 for good um, in turf. Uh, lead with one of those and then at your small larva small larval stage uh, up to probably the point of the full full bloom rhododendron stage uh, or timing uh, would be a good spot to plug in Soprato um, and then follow up with uh, one of your contacts if, if needed in between and then potentially again Soprato later in the season. Um, the label is going to allow uh, either two apps at the full rate of four quarts per acre 
or three apps at that three quarts per acre, I would suggest the four quart rate, um, particularly at that adult peak uh, timing. And uh, I'd hit them as hard as you can right out of the gates would, would be the strategy I would, I would recommend. Um, before I forget, I, I and, and kick it back to, to McKinsey, a couple of the questions that had come up uh, during Dr. McGraw's time. Um, again, we, as far as we know, some translaminar movement, and, and we, we, I think at this point we can assume that based on the activity against those internal feeding larva, um, you know, poannua plants down at that level is not, not like it's got to translo translocate very far um, or move very far, let's say, from side to side uh, to where they're likely to get exposed. They're not, they're not particularly large plants. Uh, and then uh, the, the other question from Daryl, uh, are the rates okay on greens? Uh, we have done some phyto testing, uh, including on bent grass greens and sprayed uh, when it was in the, uh, the temperature was 93 degrees Fahrenheit at up to uh, 410 ounces per acre. So that's over a 3x of the full, what ended up, ended up being the full rate with no phyto issues. Uh, and we haven't had any reported to us uh, from any cooperators either. So at this point, I will turn it back over to McKinsey um, and appreciate your attendance today. All right. Thank you both so much. That was great. Um, at this time, we're going to jump into some questions that we received during registration. For our first question, it is for Ben. Do you expect the ABW to continue migration south and west? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, I think we see it pop up in some areas outside of its distribution that's probably more related to movement and uh, sod, infested sod. So as long as that's still happening, I, I would suspect that that could occur uh, to some extent. I think it's pretty slow to move. Otherwise, it's not a big flyer. Uh, it's primarily a walker. So short answer is yeah. Okay. Um, Ian, this question is for you. Can you talk on the performance on other turf insects? Unmute. Ian, are you there? Oh, I'm sorry, I had muted myself. Um, <laughs> there are additional pests on uh, the turf label um, and we have initial uh, sometimes lab and some field results on those pests. We're continuing to look at those pests and others as well. Um, but this time we don't really, we're not presenting it as viable options for those pests necessarily because we don't know yet if this is gonna be the optimum formulation uh, for long-term control uh, we're looking at, you know, as you might imagine, combinations and some other formulations as well on these pests. Uh, and to justify the per acre uh, investment at this time, uh, we're really positioning it for an annual bluegrass weevil option at this point. Okay. This question is for both of you. What is it, the timing to begin treatments? I would say, I mean, what I would be recommending is I still like the theory of waiting a little bit after all the adults have emerged, so a little bit post-peak. Um, I think all the rates worked very well at that time. Um, if you're going to go later, I would recommend uh, using the high rate. So I would agree. I, I, I think... Um... You know, this uh, prior slide here, that program A, I think, is would, would be uh, the ideal timing. Okay. Um, this question is for Ben. 
is it possible to get ABW populations low enough and sustain them at a low number so that you don't see the damage, or do they multiply too much to do that? Well, I mean, we've shown data with 90% to 100% control, and if we were getting 100% control, then you probably wouldn't need to treat ever again, would you? But uh, I guess that's more of like an insect population dynamics theory discussion. Um, I think ideally uh, you get them to a certain level where they're sustainable, whether that's practical in the real world is, is of great debate. Um, so I would like to think yes. Uh, with this insect, I, I haven't seen it other than we have seen it totally collapse at certain sites. So that would make me think that it is possible. Um, however, I think I'm more practical realist that this is a, a pest that requires constant vigilance. Okay. Ion, this question is for you. What will be the price point on this product? I knew that one was coming. Um, <laughs> it'll it'll be priced in line with other non pyrethroid you know bluegrass weevil products in that range. Um, I you should really check with your distributor um, and they can let you know uh, you know based on promotions, timings, uh, you know early order programs, loyalty programs, et cetera, uh, to to give you an actual price on it. I don't have a a number to uh, promote today. But distrib distribution can, can let you know what, where that's gonna fall. Perfect. We have time for one more question. Um, this one is for Ben. Are we starting to see more chemically res resistant strains of ABW in Western Pennsylvania? Uh, that's a tough one. I think uh, really because they don't move a whole lot, it's not that they would be migrating to a certain location. It would be more of what you are doing on your property that would determine whether or not you're moving towards resistance. So uh, I, I would, I'm actually uh, pretty optimistic about that point. I think people are much better about controlling it, much better about reducing the number of applications, reducing wasteful applications. Uh, that being said, uh, and, and I do think like pyrethroids are the major driver and, and people, a lot of people have backed off of those, um, it, which is a different story. If you've never developed resistance, I think you can judiciously use pyrethroids and still uh, get great control. So uh, I think that's, I don't think it's kind of, I would say probably we we hit a maximum number. There will be a slow amount of percentage that will creep up probably from year to year. Uh, but I think people are getting much, much better at it. Okay. All right. Thank you for attending today's webinar, A New Chemistry for an Old Foe, Managing Annual Bluegrass Weevil with the Insect Growth Regulator Socrato. Brought to you by Golf Dumb Magazine and our sponsor of the event, QualiPro. If you have any additional questions for myself or for our speakers, you can reach out to us directly via the email addresses you see on the screen. The resources panel houses a PDF of today's presentation slides, which you can download. To access this panel, if you do not see it, click the green icon at the far right end of the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow and posted to golfdom.com slash webinars. Upcoming webinars from Golfdom will also be posted to that page. Thank you all for attending, and we hope you'll join us for another great webinar.